Cambridge Practice Tests for IELTS. Brought to you by Knowledge Island by Bilal. For computer delivered IELTS practice tests, please visit the link provided in the description. Practice test 3. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your question booklet. Section 1. You will hear a student inquiring about parking facilities. First, look at questions 1 to 4. For each of the questions, four alternatives are given. Decide which of the alternatives, A, B, C or D, best fits what you hear on the tape and circle the appropriate letter. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. How do you come to the university each day? Um, train or bus or do you have a car? Oh, I always walk. I haven't got a car and um, anyway, I live quite close. The woman says she always walks. So C has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully to the first conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. How do you come to the university each day? Um, Train or bus or do you have a car? Oh, I always walk. I haven't got a car and um, anyway, I live quite close. Do you know anything about parking rights on the campus? I was wondering whether students are allowed to park their cars on campus or not. Um, yes. I think it's possible for postgraduate students, but uh, not for undergraduate students. That doesn't seem very fair. No, I suppose not. But uh, there simply isn't enough room on the campus for everyone to park. Mm. Do you need a parking permit? Yeah, I believe you do. Where do I get that from? Um, I think you can get a parking sticker from the administration office. Where's that? It's in the building called Block G, right next to Block E. Block G? Yeah. All oh, right. And what happens to you if you don't buy a sticker? Do they clamp your wheels or give you a fine? No, I think they tow your car away. Oh, really? Yeah. And then they fine you as well, because you have to pay to get the car back. I'd better get the sticker then. Yeah. Where exactly is the administration office again? I'm new to this university and I'm still trying to find my way around. Right. You go along Library Road, mm -hmm. past the tennis courts on your left and the swimming pool on your right. Yeah. And um, the administration office is opposite the car park on the left. You can't miss it. So it's up Library Road, past the swimming pool, opposite the car park. Right. I'll go straight over there. Bye. And thanks for the help. Now you have some time to look at questions 5 to 12. As you listen to the next conversation, complete the application form in the spaces numbered 5 to 10 and answer the questions 
numbers 11 to 12. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. I was told to come over here to get a parking sticker. Is this the right place? Uh, yes, it is. Um, are you a postgraduate student? Yes, I am. Okay. Well, I'll um, just need to take some details. Uh, your name? Richard Lee. That's spelt L double E. Richard Lee. And uh, the address? Flat 13, 30 Enmore Road. How, how do you spell Enmore? Oh, e N M O R E. And that's mm -hmm. in the suburb of Newport. And N E W P O R T. Mm hmm. Faculty? I beg your pardon? Uh, which faculty are you in? Oh, architecture, the Faculty of Architecture. Right. And the registration number of your car? Uh, let me see. Um, uh, LXJ50... Oh, no, sorry, I always get that wrong. It's um, LJX058K. LJX508K? No. 058K. Ah. Um, and what make is the car? It's a Ford. A Ford. Fine. Well, um, I'll just get you to sign here, and when you've paid the cashier, I'll be able to issue you with a sticker. Right. Uh, where do I pay? Uh, just across the corridor in the cashier's office. Oh, but it's, uh, it's 12.30 now, and they close at 12.15 for lunch. Oh. Uh, but they open again at a quarter past two until um, 4.30. Oh. Um, they're not open till quarter past two. Mm, no. Uh, when you get your sticker, you must attach it to the front windscreen of your car. I'm afraid it's not valid if you don't have it stuck on the window. Right. I see. Thanks very much. I'll, um, I'll just wait here then. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk given by a guide showing a group of people round a museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 18. Now listen to the guide and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces 13 to 18. Uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the Maritime Museum. Now, before we commence our tour, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the history of the museum. As you can see, it's a very modern building built in the postmodern style and it was in fact opened by the Prime Minister of Australia in November 1991. It's been designed with a nautical flavour in mind to remind us of our links with the sea. But the museum isn't only housed in this building. There are a number of historic ships docked outside in the harbour which form part of the museum and which you are also free to visit and we'll be coming to them shortly. <laughs> I'd just like to point out one or two things of general interest while we're here. Um, handicapped toilets are located on this floor, and the door shows a wheelchair. Uh, the cloakroom, where you can hang your coat or leave your bags, is just behind us here. Uh, the education centre is on the top floor, 
and there's a good little library in there which you might like to use. Uh, follow the signs to the education centre. Uh, you'll see a lot of little green arrows on the wall. Uh, the green arrows will take you there. <laughs> the information desk, marked with the small letter I on your plan, is located right here in the foyer. So, if you get separated from your friends, I suggest you make your way back to the information desk because we'll be returning to this spot at the end of the tour. All right? Now, <laughs> if you look out this window, you should be able to see where the museum's ships are docked. If you want to go on a tour of the old ship, the Vampire, <laughs> she's docked over there. And you should meet outside on the quay. However, a word of warning. I don't recommend it for the grandmas and grandpas because there are lots of stairs to climb. Uh, right now, um, let's move on. Oh, I almost forgot to give you the times for that tour. Now, tours of the Vampire run on the hour, every hour. All right? Now look at questions 19 to 23. As you listen to the rest of the talk, complete the notes in the numbered spaces 19 to 23. Uh, let's take a walk around the museum now. The first room we're coming to is the theatre. This room is used to screen videos of special interest and we also use it for lectures. There's a continuous video showing today about the voyages of Captain Cook. So come back here later on if you want to learn more about Captain Cook. <laughs> now, we're moving along the gallery known as the Leisure Gallery. Uh, this is one of our permanent exhibitions, and here we try to give you an idea of the many different ways in which Australians have enjoyed their time by the sea. Um, surfing, swimming, life-saving clubs, uh, that's all very much a part of Australian culture. At the end of this section, we'll come to the picture gallery, where we've got a marvellous collection of paintings, all by Australian artists. I think you can buy reproductions of some of these paintings in the museum shop. They're well worth a good look. Uh, now, uh, we're coming to the members' lounge. Now, as a member of the museum, you would be entitled to use the members' lounge for refreshments. Uh, membership costs $50 a year or $70 for all the family. So, it's quite good value because entry to the museum is then Free. And down at the far end of this floor, you'll find the section which we've called Passengers and the Sea. In this part of the museum, we've gathered together a wonderful collection of souvenirs from the old days when people travelled by ship. You'll find all sorts of things there. Old suitcases, ship's crockery, first-class cabins decorated in the fashion of the day. Just imagine what it must have been like to travel first-class. <laughs> now, I'm going to leave you to walk around the museum on your own for a while, and we'll all meet back again at the information desk in uh, three-quarters of an hour's time. I hope you enjoy your time with us at the museum today. Thank you. That is the end of section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear a university student, Mark, talking to a tutor and another student about a topic he has studied. Now look at questions 24 to 32.
Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 24 to 32. Okay, everybody. Um, oh, good morning. Good morning. morning. Uh, it's Mark's turn to talk to us today, so Mark, I'll ask you to get straight down to business. All oh, right. Now, following on from what we were discussing last week in Susan's tutorial on approaches to marketing, uh, you were going to give us a quick rundown on a new strategy for pricing, which is now being used by many large companies, known as revenue management. Uh, before we go on to your actual tutorial paper on sales targets. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, OK, well... So, yeah. what exactly is revenue management? Well, it's a way of managing your pricing by treating things like mm, airline tickets and hotel rooms rather more as if they were perishable goods. Yeah, I just tried to book a ticket yesterday for Perth and would you believe there are three different prices for the flight? Right, <laughs> and what was the rationale for that? Well... The travel agent said it depended on when you book and the length of the stay. Like, uh, it's cheap if you stay away for a Saturday night, presumably because this isn't business travel, and um, even cheaper if you buy a ticket where you can't get a refund if you have to cancel. Uh -huh. In that case, the ticket costs about half the price. You wouldn't think it would make that much difference, would you? Well, it does. And that's basically because the airlines are now treating their seats like a commodity. You see, if you want a seat today then you pay far more for it than if you want it in three weeks' time. That seems rather unfair. Well, not really. When you think about it, that's just common sense, isn't it? Well, I suppose so. Uh, what this actually means is that in the same row of seats on the same flight, you could have three people who have all paid a different price for their tickets. And is this just happening in Australia? No, no, it, it's the same all over the world. Airlines are able to market a seat as a perishable product with different values at different stages of its life. Well, like mangoes or apples at the market. Yeah, it's exactly like that. The fact is that the companies are not actually interested in selling you a cheap flight. They're interested in selling the seats and flying airplanes that are full. Uh, Mark, hmm? uh, why do you think revenue management has come about? Well, as far as I can see, there are two basic reasons. Firstly, because the law has been changed to allow the companies to do this. You see, in the past, they didn't have the right to keep changing the prices of the tickets. And secondly, we now have very powerful computer programs to do the calculations and so the prices can be changed at a moment's notice. So you mean 10 minutes could be critical when you're buying a plane ticket? Absolutely. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And I understand we've almost reached the stage where these computer programs that the airlines are using will eventually be available to consumers to find the best deals for their travel plans from their home computer. Heavens, what a thought. So the travel agent could easily become a thing of the past if you could book your airline tickets from home. Yeah. Are there any other industries using this system, or is it restricted to the airline business? No, many of the big hotel groups are doing it now. Mm. That's why the price of a bed in a hotel can also vary so much, depending on when and where you book it. It's all a bit of a gamble, really. Yeah, and hire car companies are also using revenue management to set their tariffs, because they're also dealing with a commodity, if you like. So the cost of hiring a car will depend on demand. Well, uh, thank you, Mark, for that overview. That no is trouble. well researched. <laughs> now, uh, let's get on with your main topic for today. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a short talk on space management in supermarkets. First, you have some time to look at questions 33 to 37.
Now listen to the first part of the talk and complete the table by filling in the numbered spaces 33 to 37. Good morning. Welcome to this talk on space management. And today I'm going to look particularly at space management in the supermarket. Now, since the time supermarkets began, marketing consultants like us have been gathering information about customers' shopping habits. To date, various research methods have been used to help promote the sales of supermarket products. Uh, there is, for example, the, uh, the simple and direct questionnaire, which provides information from customers about their views on displays and products, and then helps retailers make decisions about what to put where. Uh, another method to help managers understand just how shoppers go around their stores are the hidden television cameras that film us as we shop and monitor our physical movement around the supermarket aisles. Where, where do we start? Uh, what do we buy last? What attracts us, etc.? Uh, more sophisticated techniques now include video surveillance, and such devices as the eye movement recorder. Uh, th this is a device which shoppers volunteer to wear taped into a headband and which traces their eye movements as they walk around the shop, recording the most eye-catching areas of shelves and aisles. But with today's technology, space management is now a highly sophisticated method of manipulating the way we shop to ensure maximum profit. Supermarkets are able to invest millions of pounds in powerful computers which tell them what sells best and where. Now, an example of this is Spaceman, which is a computer program that helps the retailer to decide which particular product sells best in which part of the store. Now, Spaceman works by receiving information from the electronic checkouts where customers pay, on how well a product is selling in a particular position. Spaceman then suggests the most profitable combination of an article and its position in the store. Now you have some time to look at questions 38 to 42. As you listen to the rest of the talk, label the diagram by filling in the numbered spaces 38 to 42. So, let's have a look at what we know about supermarkets and the way people behave when they walk down the aisles and take the articles they think they need from the shelves. Now, here's a diagram of one supermarket aisle and two rows of shelves. Here's the entrance at the top left-hand corner. Now, products placed here at the beginning of aisles don't sell well. In tests, secret fixed cameras have filmed shoppers' movements around a store over a seven-day period. When the film is speeded up, it clearly shows that we walk straight past these areas on our way to the centre of an aisle. Items placed here just don't attract people. When we finally stop at the centre of an aisle, we pause and take stock casting our eyes along the length of it. Now, products displayed here sell well and do even better if they're placed at eye level so that the customer's eyes hit upon them instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, products here are snapped up and uh, manufacturers pay a lot for these shelf areas, which are known in the trade as hot spots. Mm -hmm. Naturally, everyone wants their products to be in a hot spot. <laughs> but the, uh, the prime positions in the store are the ends of the aisles, otherwise known as gondola ends. Now, these stand out and grab our attention. For this reason, many new products are launched in these positions, and manufacturers are charged widely varying prices for this privileged spot. 
also, um, the, the, the end of an aisle may be used for uh, promoting special offers, which are frequently found waiting for us as we turn the corner of an aisle. Well, now, eventually, of course, we have to pay. Mm -hmm. Any spot where a supermarket can be sure we are going to stand still and concentrate for more than a few seconds is good for sales. Mm -hmm. That's why the shelves at the checkout have long been a favourite for manufacturers of chocolates. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the most surefire impulse food of all. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Practice test four. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your question booklet. Section one. Two students meet on the university campus. They start a conversation together. First, look at questions one to five. For each of the questions, four alternatives are given. Decide which of the alternatives, A, B, C or D, best fits what you hear on the tape and circle the appropriate letter. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Excuse me, um, can you help me? I was looking for the main hall. No, maybe I can actually. I'm looking for the main hall too. Uh, I think it's in the administration building. Are you a new student? Yeah, I am. The man says he's looking for the main hall too. So A has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully to the first conversation and answer questions one to five. Excuse me, um, can you help me? I was looking for the main hall. No, maybe I can, actually. I'm looking for the main hall, too. Uh, I think it's in the administration building. Are you a new student? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I thought you looked as lost as me. Uh, I'm trying to find the admin building, too, so I can register for my course. I don't seem to be having much luck. Well, um, look, according to this map of the campus here, you go straight up the steps, uh -huh. turn left, and the building's on the right. OK, let's see if we can find it. Ah, oh, this looks right. Yeah, yeah, it must be. Look, there are hundreds of other people here. Oh, there must be at least 50 people in the queue. We'll be here till gone 2 o'clock at this rate. Yeah, and I'm starving. So am I. Actually, I was on my way to the canteen to get something for lunch. Uh, why don't I go to the canteen and buy something, and you stay here and wait? Oh, good idea. What would you like? Pizza, sandwich, hot dog, fried rice? They do everything. Oh, something easy. 
Take away fried rice sounds good. Okay, fried rice. No, no, on, on second thoughts, I'll have a cheese and tomato sandwich. Right, one cheese and tomato. Anything to drink? Yeah, give me coffee, would you? Uh, hot coffee's a bit hard to carry. What about a Coke or an orange juice? Um, get me an orange juice then. Look, here's five dollars. Oh, yeah, take two dollars back. Shouldn't cost me more than three dollars. Well, get the five. We'll sort it out later. Oh, and could you get me an apple as well? Okay, back in a minute. The woman speaks to the clerk about registering at university. Look at questions six to ten. As you listen, complete the form by filling in the numbered spaces 6 to 10. Oh, hello. I'm here to register for the first year law course. Oh, I'll just have to fill out this form for our records. Um, what's your name? Julia Perkins. Can you spell that for me? Yeah, that's um, J-U-L-I-A-P-E-R-K-I-N-S. Um, address? Flat 5, 15 Waratah Road, that's W-A-R-A-T-A-H, Brisbane. Brisbane. Oh, and your telephone number? Oh, we haven't got the phone on yet. We've only just moved in. OK, well, can you let us have the number once the phone's connected? And I'll make a note here uh, to be advised. Uh, and the course? Beg your pardon? What course are you doing? Oh, um, first year law. Right. Well, you'll have to go across to the law faculty and get this card stamped and then you come back here with it and pay your union fee. Oh, thanks very much. The man and the woman meet up again. Look at questions 11 and 12 and circle the correct answer. Oh, there you are. Oh, I thought you were never going to come back. <laughs> Sorry, the canteen was absolutely packed. I had to wait for ages. And then when I got to the front of the queue, there had hardly any food left. So I had to get you a slice of pizza. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I could eat anything. I'm so hungry. Oh, and there's your bottle of orange juice and your apple. At least I managed that. Great. Thanks a lot. No, oh, and here's your two dollars back. Don't worry about it. Buy me a cup of coffee later. Oh, all right then. So how'd you go? Oh, well, in order to register, we've got to go to the law faculty and get this card stamp, and then go back to the admin building and pay the union fees. That means we're registered. Mm -hmm. After that, we have to go to the notice board to find out about lectures, and then we have to put our names down for tutorial groups and go to the library. Oh, oh great. Well, well, first let's sit down and have our lunch, eh? <laughs> That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a talk about banks in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 17.
Now listen to the talk and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces 13 to 17. Uh, okay, um, right, uh, thanks for turning up today. Thanks for turning up today to this short talk I'm going to give on student banking. Uh, many of you are unfamiliar with the way banks work in this country, and today's talk should just give you a few starting points. Uh, I will, of course, answer any questions at the end. Right, well, as you probably know, you'll need to open a bank account while you're here, and it's the safest place to keep your money. And it's best to open an account with one of the major banks. You should each have a handout with the names and addresses. Yeah? Right. There's, um, there's Barclays in Realty Square, National Westminster in Preston Park, Lloyd's in City Plaza, and Midland in Hope Street. Okay. All these banks offer special student accounts. However, it's important to note that as an international student, you'll not necessarily be eligible for all the facilities offered to resident students. Now, as an international student, you will need to provide evidence that you can fund yourself for however long your course lasts. Um, banks have different policies, and the services that they'll offer you will depend on your individual circumstances and on the discretion of the bank manager involved. So um, it's a matter of going there and finding out about your own particular situation. Right. Um, when you do go to open a bank account, you should take some documentation with you. Uh, I've already mentioned that you must be able to support yourself. I in addition to this, most banks ask you to bring your passport and your letter or certificate of enrolment. Okay? Now, by far the most useful type of account to open is a current account. When you do this, you will actually get what is called a student account, which is a current account with special concessions for students. When you open the account, the bank will give you a checkbook, and you can use this to draw money out as you need it. If you need to write checks in shops, you'll also need a check card. This is really an identity card which guarantees that correctly written cheques up to the value stated on the card will be honoured by the bank. OK? Everybody with me? Now look at questions 18 to 21. As you listen to the rest of the talk, complete the rest of the notes in the spaces numbered 18 to 21. Right, uh, if you want to draw out cash for yourself, you can make the cheque payable in your own name or to cash. Mm -hmm. You can also withdraw cash from a cash point machine with a cash card. Now, these are extremely useful as they enable you to withdraw cash from your account during the day or at night. Um, there is also another card called Switch or Delta and you can use this to pay for things in shops. Um, it takes the money right out of your account so you don't need your checkbook. Now, you may want to take more money out of the bank than you have in it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is called having an overdraft. Be very careful with this. You should not do this without permission from your bank. Overdrafts usually incur charges, though some banks offer interest-free overdrafts to some students. But find out before you get one, right? Well, that just leaves opening times. <laughs> when can you go? Banks used to be open from 9.30 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. from Monday to Friday. But many main branches are now open until 4.30 or 5 p.m. on weekdays, and some of the bigger branches in London and other major cities are now open for a limited time on Saturdays. 
Okay, um, any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. Two students, Dawn and Ilmar, are discussing a project that they are working on together. First, you have some time to look at questions 22 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and complete the fact sheet by filling in the numbered spaces 22 to 25. Hi Dawn. Oh, hi Omar. I'm glad I've bumped into you. I've just found a great idea for the presentation we've got to do for Dr. Banks next month. What, the one on everyday objects? Yes. Look at this article. It's really interesting. Uh, the aluminium coat? Can? You know, Coca-Cola cans, soft drink cans. Look, let's sit down here. Have you got a minute? Sure. I'll just get my bag. Okay. So, you think we can get a presentation out of this article? I'm sure we can. First of all, we can provide some interesting facts about the aluminium cans that we drink out of every day. Like... Well, here it says that in the U.S. they produce 300 million aluminium drink cans each day. Wow! 300 million? Exactly. That's an enormous number. Mm. It says here, outstrips the production of nails or paper clips. <laughs> and they say that the manufacturers of these cans exercise as much attention and precision in producing them as aircraft manufacturers do when they make the wing of an aircraft. Really? Yeah. Let's have a look. They're trying to produce the perfect can, as thin but as strong as possible. Hmm. This bit's interesting. Today's can weighs about 0.48 ounces, thinner than two pieces of paper, <laughs> from this magazine, say. Yeah, and yet it can take a lot of weight. More than 90 pounds of pressure per square inch. Three times the pressure of a car tyre. <sighs> OK, I agree. It's a good topic. Now look at the diagram of the aluminium can and at questions 26 to 31. As the conversation continues, label the can by completing the notes in the numbered spaces 26 to 31. What I thought was that we could do a large picture of a Coke can and label it and then talk about the different parts. Look, I've done a rough picture here. OK, so where shall we start? Well, the lid is complicated. Mm. Let's start with the body first. I'll do a line from the centre of the can, like this, and label it body. What does it say? It's made of aluminium, of course, and it's thicker at the bottom. Right, so that it can take all that pressure. And then I think you should draw another line from the body for the label. 
Right. Label. The aluminium is ironed out until it's so thin that it produces... Oh, what does it say? Uh, a reflective surface suitable for decoration. That's right. Apparently it helps advertisers, too. Yes, because it's so attractively decorated. Good. And then there's the base. Yes, it says the bottom of the can is shaped like a dome so that it can resist the internal pressure. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Nor did I. Okay, so going up to the lid, there are several things we can label here. There's the rim around the edge which seals the can. Got that. And there's a funny word for the seal, isn't there? Yes. It's a flange. What does it say about it? Well, the can's filled with coke or whatever, and after that the top of the can is trimmed and then bent over to secure the lid. That's right. It looks like a seam. We could even do a blow-up of it, like this. F-L-A-N-G-E. Yes, that would be clearer. I think we should label the lid itself and say that it constitutes 25% of the total weight. 25%? Mm. So it's stronger than the body of the can. Mm. So to save money, manufacturers make it smaller than the rest of the can. Didn't know that either. So, how do we open a can of Coke? Hmm. First of all, there's the tab, which we pull up to open the can, and that's held in place by a rivet. Hmm. I think that's too small for us to include. I agree. But we can talk about it in the presentation. We can show the opening, though. That's the bit of the can that drops down into the drink when we pull the tab. Yeah, hopefully. Sometimes the tab just breaks off. I know. Anyway, the opening is scored so that it pushes in easily but doesn't detach itself. Okay. We can show that by drawing a shadow of it inside the can. Like this. Mm. I'll label it scored opening. Great. Well, I think we've got the basis of a really interesting presentation. Mm. Let's go and photocopy the article. Fine. I'll take it home and study it some more. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear part of a short university lecture. First, look at questions 32 to 42. Now listen and complete the lecture notes in the spaces numbered 32 to 42. Uh, good morning and welcome to the university's open day and to our mini lecture from the sports studies department. Now, the purpose of this lecture is twofold. One, we want you to experience a university lecture to give you a taste of what listening to a university lecture is like. And two, we want you to find out something about the sports studies program at this university. So feel free to ask any questions during the talk and I'll do my best to answer them. <clears throat> right, so what does a course in sports studies involve? Well, you wouldn't be blamed for not knowing the answer to this question because sports studies as a discipline 
is still comparatively new, but it's a growing area and one which is now firmly established at our university. Now, there are three distinct strands to sports studies, and you'd need to choose fairly early on just which direction you wanted to follow. And I'll just run over these now. Firstly, we've got the sports psychology strand. Secondly, we've got the sports management strand. And last but not least, there's the sports physiology strand. So just to recap, there's sports psychology, sports management, and sports physiology. Uh, let's look first at psychology. Now, the people who study sports psych want to work with top athletes, and they're looking at what will take those athletes that 1% extra. What makes them win? When all other things are equal, physically all other things are equal, they want to know what are the mental factors involved. The sports psychologist works closely with the athlete through his or her training program and becomes an integral part of the team. In fact, you could say that they play just as important a role as the coach. So if you're interested in what makes people win, this could be the area for you. Now secondly, we've got the strand which I refer to as sports management. And this goes hand in hand with the area of sports marketing. So you might like to think of this area as having two branches, management and marketing. On the management side, we look at issues relating to the running of sports clubs, management of athletes, that sort of thing. But then on the other side, we've got sports marketing. And this is the side that interests me more, because here we will look at the market forces behind sport. Questions like, why do people spend their money on a football match or a tennis game, rather than, say, on buying a CD or going to the cinema? What are those market forces? Sport used to just compete with sport. Nowadays, it competes with other leisure activities. The spectators go to sport to be entertained, rather than out of loyalty to a team. They want to have an evening out, and they don't want the cheap seats anymore. They want good seats. They want entertainment. And the professional sportsmen and women respond to this without question. They are there to give a performance. They provide the entertainment. So in the marketing course, we address all these commercial issues, and we look at how this hooks back into the management of sport. Now, the third branch of sports studies sometimes comes under another name, and is also known as exercise science. And again here, we find that there are two distinct types of exercise science. The first is working very much at the macro level, what I call the huffing and puffing people. So this looks at fitness testing, body measurements, all that sort of thing. But the more interesting side of sports physiology, at least in my view, is the side that looks at the micro level, looking at cellular change. They're doing cellular research, looking at changes in body cells when the body is under stress. So that just about brings us to the end of our mini lecture for today. I hope you found it interesting. And I look forward to seeing you all on our course next year. But feel free to come and talk to me if you want any more information. Um, I'll be over at that notice board near the main entrance. Thank you very much. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. If you are new to our channel, please subscribe us and press the bell icon to get more updates. Don't forget to comment, like, and share our video.